Today we're going to talk about quantitative research designs with emphasis on experimental research design. There are two broad types of quantitative research designs, experimental and non-experimental. Unlike qualitative research, which values emergent and flexible research designs, quantitative designs tend to be heavily standardized, structured, and ones that use larger sample sizes representative of larger populations. Experimental research is when a researcher is able to manipulate the independent variable to identify a cause and effect relationship. This typically requires the research to be conducted in a controlled environment, with one group being placed in an experimental group while the other is placed in a control group. Non-experimental research is the label given to a study when a researcher cannot control, manipulate, or alter the independent variable but instead relies on interpretation, observation, or interactions to come to a conclusion. Now that we have discussed the basics of what they are, we can see some of the differences between them. Experimental researchers are capable of performing experiments on people and manipulating independent variables. Non-experimental researchers are forced to observe and interpret what they are looking at. Being able to manipulate and control something leads to the next big difference. The ability to find a cause and effect relationship is kind of a big deal in the world of science. Being able to say X causes Y is something that has a lot of power. While non-experimental research can come close, Non-experimental researchers cannot say with absolute certainty that X leads to Y. Experimental research is founded on causation theory. This means we assume changing conditions will in turn affect the outcomes of research. Listed here are a few examples of independent variables and dependent variables found in experimental research. The effects of a new treatment plan on breast cancer, the effect of a positive reinforcement on attitude towards schools, the effects of teaching with cooperative group strategy or a traditional lecture approach on student achievement. By manipulating the independent variable, a researcher is able to learn a great deal, as well as point to the manipulated variable as the cause for change. For example, one study by Elizabeth Loftus had subjects view the same video of one car rear-ending another. Afterwards, the viewers were asked, how fast was the car going when it bumped into the next car? Or, how fast was the car going when it careened and crashed into the next car? The answers varied significantly, but everyone had seen the same video. In experimental research, we want to make sure the independent variable causes the dependent variable. Independent and dependent variables are sometimes called by other names. Independent variables are also called treatment variables since they are the variables representing the treatment group in an experiment. A causal variable because they are causing a change in the dependent variable or the experimental variable because the variable is being introduced for the first time during a new experiment. The dependent variable also has other names. It is called a criterion variable after the criterion that is measured in an experiment, the effect variable because it is measuring the effect of the causal variable, or the post-test variable because it measures the outcomes of a post-test in an experiment. Let's take a few minutes to further explore independent and dependent variables. Independent versus dependent variables. Correlational studies are unstructured observations. You are simply recording what you can observe. Experimental methods require structured observation that results in the manipulation of variables. The term variables simply refers to something that varies. In this case, we need to discriminate between two types of variables, independent and dependent variables. A dependent variable is something that we want to measure as an outcome. 
In an experiment, we manipulate the independent variable by creating a control condition, which is basically no manipulation, and an experimental condition, where we have manipulated something. In both conditions, we measure the dependent variable to determine if there's a difference in observed outcomes. So as you can see, the outcome of variable y is dependent on variable x, because as we manipulated x, the outcome y was affected. Experimental research design depends on a researcher's ability to attempt to control for outside factors that can impact the outcome of an experiment. Extraneous variables are variables that ac can account for change in the dependent variable. These are undesirable variables that can impact the results of an experiment and make it difficult to know whether changes in the dependent variable are really due to the independent variable or something else entirely. Let's take a moment to explore extraneous variables further. The procedure and vocabulary involved in an experiment. Terms such as trial, random assignment, control group, experimental group, and independent and dependent variables should be second nature to you. And you should be aware that an experiment is designed to determine the effect of an independent variable on a dependent variable. See Difficult Topics video, Experimental Design. Now in a perfect experiment, only the independent variable would have any effect on the dependent variable. But alas, life and experiments are rarely perfect. Extraneous variables are often present in an experiment and may or may not compromise the validity of the experiment. An extraneous variable that affects the validity of an experiment is referred to as a confounding variable. Now, to better understand what I mean, let's take an experiment that's been done in grade schools for generations. Let's see whether sunlight makes plants grow. You start your light growth experiment by placing one plant in the sunlight and one in the darkness, and then you wait. When you see that one of your plants is doing better than the other, you automatically assume that it's due to the sunlight but you may be wrong. Did you accurately measure the water given to each? Or how about the soil and air temperature, or the size of the containers, and even the location? These are all extraneous variables, extra variables that may or may not interfere with your experiment. Now, if any of these extraneous variables impact your results, then we call it a confounding variable. Think of all the extraneous and confounding variables that may be present in a psychological experiment, especially those involving humans. Then you'll get an idea of why it's so important to recognize extraneous variables, especially the confounding ones. Experimental researchers hope to control for confounding variables and also increase internal validity. The problem with extraneous variables is that they might affect the dependent variable, but they might not. There's no way to tell until after an experiment is done. After defining independent and dependent variables, experimental researchers look to forming a research hypothesis. A hypothesis is an educated prediction that provides an explanation for an observed event. An observed event is a measurable result or condition. Operationalizing a variable means finding a way to measure it or quantify it. Next, we'll look at setting up experimental research design. Experimental research design involves choosing how best to answer a research question. One way to design an experiment is by using a control group or group of subjects that do not get the treatment being studied in the experiment. The experimental group does get the treatment and then the two groups are compared to see if the treatment had an effect. Control groups are important because they help the researcher eliminate the effects of variables they are not interested in studying, a process called controlling for other variables. Let's take a moment to explore control groups further. Comparison or control group. Those who are in the experimental group will get whatever is being researched in the study. Those in a control group will usually get the standard treatment for the condition. If there is no standard treatment, those in the control group might get a placebo that looks the same but is not intended to have the same effect as the experimental treatment, or they might get nothing at all.
A control group is needed because people will naturally change a bit from one day to the next, even without being in a study. Some days people feel good, and some days they feel a bit worse. Sometimes just knowing they are in a study can change the way a person feels. Even some blood tests can be different from one time to the next because of things like diet, stress, hormones, or mood. And sometimes things can change without any known reason. Since everyone in the study will experience different natural changes, researchers can measure the changes in each person, add them together, and find the average change for each group. If the average change in all the groups is the same, then the changes in any one person, whether for better or worse, are probably due to natural variation and not whatever is being researched. However, if the average change in the experimental group is much better or worse than in the control group, it's likely that the new treatment is what's making a difference. A control group is used to help researchers know the difference between these natural changes and the true effects of whatever is being researched. Now that you've watched the video, try to answer the following question. What do control group members receive when there is no standard treatment? The answer is a placebo. In experimental research, there are three experimental designs, pretest, post-test, post-test only, and Solomon IV group design. The most common experimental research design is the pretest, post-test design, in which participants are assessed before and after an intervention has been applied. This design may or may not use a control group, However, in true experimental study, a control group is almost always used. The post-test only design only assesses participants after a treatment has been applied. One weakness of this type of study is that it's hard to account for performance prior to the intervention being applied. A byproduct of these designs is the Solomon IV group design. There are two groups who are pre and post tested within this design and two groups that are follow the post test only model of design. This design helps to measure the extent to which an intervention or treatment has an effect. After experimental researchers choose one of the three designs discussed, the final decision they make is who will participate in their experiments. When they're studying a research question, the entire group of people they're interested in is called a target population. This population is a relatively large group. A sample of this group of people um, will actually be participating in their study. The sample is always smaller than the population. The next thing researchers need to do is figure out how to narrow down their population to choose their sample for their study. One way to attempt to get a good sample from the population is to make a list of every person in the population, then choose randomly from that list. This type of sample, as you might guess, is called random sampling. The definition of a random sample is one in which every person in the larger population has an equal chance of being in the sample. The idea behind a random sample is that it's probably representative of the population, meaning any important variables that are in the population are equally present in the sample. A more complicated version of random sample is called a stratified random sample. Here researchers identify important variables in advance, divide up the population based on this variable, and then randomly choose an equal number of people from each group for the sample. One of the last things experimental researchers do is try to guard against internal validity threats. In research, internal validity is the extent to which you are able to say that no other variables except the one you're studying cause the result. Listed here are four common threats to experimental design internal validity. Mortality is when some subjects from the comparison groups drop out before the experiment is finished resulting in differences between the groups that may be unrelated to the treatment effects. History. 
is when events occur during an experiment that may affect the participants' responses on the dependent measure. Maturation is physiological processes occurring within the participants that could account for any changes in their behavior. And testing is when students are repeatedly tested, making changes in their scores that could be due to practice or knowledge about the test procedure gained from prior experience as opposed to treatment effects. Researchers also have to guard against external validity of threats. External validity is the extent to which the results of a study can be generalized to a broader population. In order to have high external validity, a study must be able to be replicated by other researchers. In addition, a researcher must know that their independent variable and no other variables are causing the changes in their dependent variable, which is known as internal validity. In reality, internal and external validity are always at tension, and good researchers strike a balance between the two. The two types of external validity threats guarded against in experimental design are population selection and generalizability. In summary, experimental designs are highly structured. They use independent and dependent variables to form hypotheses. There are three types of experimental design, pretest, post-test, post-test only, and Solomon Four group design. Sample sizes for experimental designs are large. Sampling is strongest when done by stratified random sampling. Internal validity threats for experimental design include mortality, history, maturation, and testing. External validity threats include population selection and generalizability. Experimental researchers must always control for extraneous variables.